Well, let's get started. Um, to um, all who joined a little bit earlier, uh, thank you for putting up uh, with us as we're making a few final adjustments to the start of this webinar, um, which uh, we're really excited to, uh, to put on. Uh, this is from the American Society of Echo Council on Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease, and the webinar is titled Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome in Children in the Setting of COVID-19, or how we've all come to learn it as MISC. Uh, and this will be a clinical and uh, imaging, uh, imaging update. Um, it is my distinct uh, 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 privilege and pleasure to moderate uh, uh, this session. We have an exceptional group of uh, speakers. Um, um, and uh, we're also joined by Dr. Kerry Altman, who is the incoming chair of the ASC Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease Council. Um, to start with our speakers, um, um, Jane, Dr. Jane Burns uh, is internationally known for her work studying Kawasaki disease for the past 30 years. She is professor of pediatrics at University of California, San Diego, um, and has a background in infectious diseases and molecular virology. Uh, she's the director of the Kawasaki Disease Research Center <clears throat> at UCSD with support from NHLBI for a biorepository to better understand environmental triggers, genetic influences, molecular pathogenesis, and novel treatments for Kawasaki disease. Doctor, next is Dr. Nadine Schwader. Uh, she is a professor, so, associate professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital at Montefiore and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, she has uh, been working in New York City throughout uh, uh, the uh, intense uh, uh, epidemic uh, of COVID-19 there, uh, and we'll have bring that unique experience to this uh, webinar. She also directs the Cardiac Non-Invasive Imaging Program at Montefiore and co-leads the Kawasaki Disease Program and is leading the Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children uh, uh, effort at Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Kevin Friedman is Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School in Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, he specializes in cardiac imaging from the fetus through the adult, and he has particular expertise in the diagnosis and management of, of Kawasaki disease, including long-term management of Kawasaki disease patients with coronary artery aneurysms. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, we have Dr. Owen Miller, who is our international representative. He is an associate professor and reader at King's College in London in Evelina Children's Hospital. He has trained in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, and peds intensive care at centers from England to Switzerland to Australia. Uh, he's head of service for congenital heart disease and director of specialist networks at Evelina Children's Hospital. He's an expert imager. Um, um, and has also been very active in the Association for European Pediatric and Congenital Cardiology and the European Society of Cardiology. Um, so um, we have our wonderful group of speakers and I'm sure we're all looking forward to hearing uh, what they have to say. And so we will move uh, promptly uh, um, um, to our first speaker, Dr. Schwader, um, um, who will present COVID-19 and multi-inflammatory syndrome uh, uh, in children, the North American experience. As one reminder, as we start, um, as one reminder, as we start, I would uh, uh, ask people to submit questions through the Q&A tab um, in, the Zoom, uh, in the Zoom meeting. We'll give instructions for completing CME at the end of the presentation. Dr. Schrader, I think uh, you have the control. Um, thank you for, uh, thank you, Pierce and uh, Carrie, for inviting me uh, to speak today about our experience in New York on MISC. Um, so I will be discussing um, so far our numbers in New York State being um, a hotspot for the COVID-19 pandemic as well as MISC. Um, go into a little bit more details uh, over the ADC published cases so far in New York, and then discuss our experience at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore taking care of those patients and also our uh, plans for follow-up. I have no disclosures. So, so far, as of June 25th, there are 225 cases of MISC that are being investigated in New York and 39 confirmed cases at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. 
and uh, there are uh, three deaths attributable to uh, MISC. None of these uh, deaths, though, have been secondary to um, cardiac disease. Based on the uh, New York State Department of Health, uh, most of these children, you can see here the age distribution of these children, the majority or three quarters of these children are anywhere between 1 to 14 years of age. And based on the three publications uh, on MISC that came out of four centers in New York, the majority are between 8 to 10 years, 61% of them are males, 30% black, and 33% Hispanic. Those 83 published cases that we will discuss happened in a cluster of, uh, period between April 17 to May 23rd. And similar to the European data, the majority were antibody positive, even though they were uh, PCR negative. Um, also, um, there was a lot of patients presenting with gastrointestinal symptoms, such as abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. It was kind of a hallmark of the presentation of these children. 70% uh, were classified as Kawasaki disease, either classic in 35% or atypical in another 35%. And a majority presented in shock, another hallmark of this disease, and 60% of those required inotrope, one patient required ECMO, and one patient required an intra-aortic balloon pump. 61% of these patients have had LV dysfunction, which was mostly mild to moderate. Only 7% had severe dysfunction. And in 50% of the cases, the function recovered before discharge. Coronary artery lesions have been described in various ways in this lesion. Um, I would say that 30% had Z-scores above 2.5, where in the Kawasaki disease literature, that would be considered an aneurysm. And, uh, Sorry, that was 19% um, that had a Z-score of 2.5, and only one patient had a moderate aneurysm with a Z-score of more than 5. There were no uh, reported uh, Z-scores more than 10 or giant aneurysms in uh, New York. 13% required mechanical ventilation, which is uh, less than what uh, the European data reported. And as I mentioned, uh, we had three deaths in New York. One has been published, and it was reported secondary to an ECMO complication. These uh, children presented very sick, yet stayed in the hospital four to seven days, so recovered quickly. They had elevated inflammatory markers, and more importantly, they had elevated cardiac enzymes, troponins, and pro-BNP. Their platelets were um, low to normal. In terms of treatment, um, there was definitely a variation in practice. The majority of patients, 77% received IVIG. One center gave it to 100% of patients, followed by steroids in 46% of patients. Um, the IL inhibitors, uh, anakindra and tocilizumab, were used at a much lesser rate. At Montefiore, you can actually see here our uh, daily hospital census from March 1st to June 25th. Um, you can see our COVID-19 cases in red and our MISC cases in green. We peaked in COVID-19 cases in, on April 12th with 1,900 cases. And at that time, we were seeing some cases that we um, diagnosed with Kawasaki disease. We had a few myocarditis cases. And then towards the end of April, so three weeks after um, the uh, peak, we started to see those children who were presenting very sick in, in shock with Kawasaki disease features. Um, and along the same, you can see how that number went up significantly. And then towards at the end of May and early June, we kind of plateaued so, such that we're now having one case every week. And we have so far 39 cases. Their clinical uh, data and demographics are very similar to the uh, published data within New York uh, in terms of the uh, majority having gastrointestinal symptoms and 50% of them presenting in shock. Um, what is also interesting, though, is that we had 47% Hispanic, slightly higher uh, than the uh, remaining data, and that's be that represents our population in the Bronx. We have a high, uh, we have a um, high number of uh, Hispanics in the Bronx. 
we were able to, when we looked at our cases, we were able to categorize them into four major categories. Three of those categories were either at risk or had cardiac involvement. And these were uh, those that were fit criteria for Kawasaki disease, those that had acute myocardial injury defined by ventricular dysfunction and increased cardiac enzymes, and those who presented in shock. You can see that there is major overlap based on these Venn diagrams between those three major categories, such as five patients presented in shock, fit criteria for Kawasaki disease, and had left ventricular dysfunction. The fourth category were those patients who presented with gastrointestinal or neurologic symptoms and had no cardiac involvement at all. So when we looked at their um, laboratory data, which I'm, I will not go over right now, but essentially they definitely had, similar to what's been described, increased inflammatory markers and increased cardiac enzymes. Looking at their um, echo data, we find that, again, um, we had close to um, 60% with left ventricular dysfunction. The majority were within the mild to moderate range. We also had right ventricular dysfunction in 8% of patients. We had one patient with severe MR, one with moderate TR, and one had a small pericardial effusion. We didn't have hemodynamically significant effusions. 13% of our patients presented with coronary artery lesions, and 8% presented with small aneurysms. We did not have moderate or large aneurysms. Treatment, uh, in terms of treatment, it was, uh, we focused on supportive therapy, um, and we gave IVIG to those who fit the criteria for Kawasaki disease, 38% of our patients. We gave steroids to those with CRPs above 10, or those whose CRPs doubled within 24 hours, or those where we were escalating respiratory support or refractory shock. Uh, we gave mesopred over five days, and we did not taper, and that um, we gave it to 25% of our patients, and 8% received IL-1 inhibitors. Um, so these patients stayed in the unit or the hospital around six days. Uh, 95% of them had recovery of left ventricular function before discharge. The coronary artery uh, lesions that we found during admission um, recovered, uh, and that was anywhere between three days to two weeks. Uh, we had one patient who presented seven days at their um, se seven day mark, um, developed uh, um, a moderately dilated uh, left anterior descending with a Z score of 3.2. Um, and that was a patient who presented with shock and no KD features. We had no deaths. Here you can actually see the uh, graph that represents the change in left ventricular ejection fraction in those who presented with or developed uh, left ventricular dysfunction within the first 24 hours of admission. So we had three patients who presented with normal function that quickly they compensated within 24 hours. And then in terms of recovery, the majority recovered by day eight, and we had two patients who recovered by day 18 or day 20, uh, from uh, either from uh, day 18 of hospitalization or at the time when we saw them in clinic. So at CHAM, um, those echoes are performed uh, following uh, our contact and droplet isolation um, requirements. You can see here our tech fully dressed with all the PPE, the machine board is covered. And we are doing echoes on those with elevated cardiac enzymes, those who are, we're suspecting KD or atypical KD, those with shock, with cardiomegaly on x-ray or changes on EKG. The protocol is a modified KD protocol. We're looking at function and we're trying to evaluate the coronaries, the proximal and the, um, the proximal and distal coronaries. And I would say that some of our patients um, it's, it's interesting because the population that fit KD criteria were older than what we're used to seeing, so we, the coronaries were definitely a challenge. So this is here, I'm going to give a few examples. This is here a patient, uh, one of our sickest patients who presented in shock at two months of age. Um, and you can see his um, um, left ventricle, their severe dysfunction, the EF is 29%. This patient was intubated, received uh, steroids, um, inotropes, and remdesivir uh, 
patient was PCR positive. And you can actually see here on the right-hand side the function recovered completely by day 12. That same patient had severe MR on presentation. Um, the LV looked globular but was not um, dilated because we were concerned at the time for dilated cardiomyopathy. We weren't aware of the entity of MISC. What we also noticed is by day 28 that mitral valve regurgitation significantly improved. This is the nine-year-old patient in shock and left ventricular dysfunction that I uh, just described. This is on uh, day one. Um, so we're looking at the coronaries of all these patients. And what we saw is on day one, his left anterior descending Z-score was 1.5. By day seven, you can notice that just visually that it's dilated. The Z-score at that point was 3.2. And then by day 14, um, it decreased in size and the LAD um, Z-score came back, came back to two, which is not something that we are used to seeing um, with Kawasaki disease. We didn't see any fusiform or saccular aneurysms in our patient population. So like all uh, programs, we have, um, we have devised our uh, uh, guidelines for diagnosis and management of these patients. And what I really wanted to point out is our management was really tailored based on presentation. So that those in shock went to the ICU and predominantly got supportive therapy. If they fit KD uh, criteria based on the 2017 guidelines, they received IVIG. We gave steroids usually on a case-by-case -case basis, discussing that with uh, rheumatology. Um, and the remaining patients were on the floor with cardiology being consulted if there is any concern for increased enzymes, um, cardiomegaly on x-ray, or an abnormal EKG. And, um, and anticoagulation being managed by the Kawasaki disease team and the um, uh, hematology service. And we followed these patients. Uh, we're following these patients now in what is known as the PIMS clinic. We called it the PIMS clinic before MISC terminology came out. Um, and you, what you see is, again, we follow them based on their initial presentation and uh, whether there's residual disease before discharge. Essentially, what's in red is what cardiologists are seeing, so anybody who has decreased function, anybody who presented in shock or who had Kawasaki disease. Um, we plan um, to see them uh, a week, a month, six months, and a year after um, after they've been discharged, and, and we're discussing further um, imaging um, of the myocardium at six months with cardiac MRI in those who had uh, decreased function and evaluation of the coronaries in those with aneurysms uh, by, either, by cardiac CT, again, um, at around six months. We have seen so far um, 35 patients uh, after, you know, after discharge. And all of them have normal function. Um, we have seen close to four of them one month post-discharge. Um, so far, all of them have normal function, and uh, we have not seen any fusiform or saccular aneurysms. Um, and the one patient I mentioned and discussed was the one who developed coronary artery uh, dilation um, after, after discharge, um, and, I, and I described showing the images. Um, and that is mainly it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Schroeder. That was excellent, and and thank you very much for sharing uh, uh, experiences of your experiences in, in New York in particular. Um, I'd like to uh, um, if we can switch over the um, um, the control uh, uh, to Dr. Burns. Um, <clears throat> Um, and advance the, uh, to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Burns will be talking about SARS-CoV-2, MISC, and Kawasaki disease. Dr. Burns. <laughs> 
if it go back. Great. I think you now can hear me. I don't seem to have control of the slides, however, so you'll need to advance them for me. Um, this patient had all of the typical features of uh, Kawasaki disease and this new MISC overlap. And those features are, are shown here. And for those of you who have taken care of Kawasaki disease patients in the past, these laboratory features are somewhat unusual. So a lower white count, a lower platelet count, and the other features of inflammation. This particular patient had positive antibody titers, but many of these patients that we're beginning to see now do not. So next slide, please. If you could go back to the slide. Sorry. Uh, the cardiac features in terms of echocardiography were that this patient had dilation of the left anterior descending. He responded very promptly to anti-inflammatory therapy. And although his fever initially resolved, he went on to require steroids to get control of his recurrent fever. And by echocardiography, had very prompt resolution of his dilated left anterior descending. Next slide. These are some of the features of other patients who have presented in the spectrum of MISC. And clearly you recognize these as features that are typical of our previous Kawasaki disease population, including the strawberry tongue, the rash, the changes in the vermilion border of the lips and the conjunctival injection. Next slide. In this comparison of MISC patients with the British nomenclature of PIMS-TS, we compared our population of Kawasaki disease patients from the prior era, as well as KD shock patients and patients with toxic shock. The features were in some ways similar and in other ways distinctly different. So I've just chosen a few of these. This is from a JAMA paper uh, from Liz Whitaker and the group at Imperial in collaboration with our group. And there are a lot of comparisons there, but I just pulled out some of the key features. We've already talked about how age is very different from our classic KD patients, although there's obviously a distribution of the age of KD patients that overlaps with these new MISC patients. Ferritin levels tend to be higher as an example of some of the inflammatory markers. Liver enzymes can be elevated in our KD population, and this was not particularly a feature of any of the MISC patients. D-dimer is elevated and can be elevated both in KD shock as well as our KD population. And of course, the white count can be both low and high. So features that are similar, features that are completely different, and a significant amount of overlap between these different groups. Next slide. I wanted to highlight some of the variables that are important in identifying these MISC patients and differentiating them from our Kawasaki patients. If you could hit the advance button, there you go. Um, the white count, the platelet count, and the serum sodium were notably different from a series of over a thousand Kawasaki disease patients from the previous era that we have in our database. So a white blood cell count less than 5,000, a platelet count less than 120,000, and a serum sodium less than 130 were characteristics that were distinctly rare in our previous Kawasaki disease population and were really a defining feature of these new MISC patients. Next slide. So there are different camps and the debate is raging as to what the meaning is of these clinical similarities and dissimilarities between Kawasaki disease and MISC. So on the one hand, 
there is the hypothesis that these are completely different discrete entities. They have different pathophysiology. Their ideas about super antigen response to portions of the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. There are other hypotheses about how there are shared clinical features, but of course we know many different children can have rash and fever and red lips and it's not Kawasaki disease and it's not the same pathophysiology. On the other fork in the road, there are striking similarities between these children presenting with MIS-C and KD. And I think one of the most striking similarities is their response to their rapid response to anti-inflammatory therapy. And because of the clinical similarity between KD and MISC, as we heard about in the New York series, they looked a little bit like strange Kawasaki disease patients. And so people reached for IVIG, the standard therapy for KD. And in fact, these patients responded to a great degree. Many needed additional anti-inflammatory therapy but in fact, they were fairly easy to treat from an inflammation standpoint. So could MISC and KD share a common pathway, a pathophysiologic pathway that is triggered by different antigens in hosts with different genetic susceptibilities? We can sit here and debate this fork in the road, but ultimately we're going to have to answer it at the molecular level and I think keep an open mind about what the importance is of finding similarities or dissimilarities between these two conditions. And certainly in terms of treatment, it served us well to think of them as following a similar path. Next slide. We are now seeing a number of patients who comprise the submerged part of the iceberg and this is, was also in the New York series, I think many of us are seeing a very small number of patients with the shock syndrome, so the very tip of this iceberg, a larger number of patients who have a KD-like illness that shares clinical features, but clearly is related to exposure and antecedent exposure to the SARS-CoV-2 virus with an antibody response that can be measured. And now we're seeing a number of patients coming in to the ward. These are hemodynamically stable patients. They have very high inflammatory markers, nothing on their physical exam. And yet when we do an echo, despite the fact that they are hemodynamically stable, we are seeing changes suggestive of depressed left ventricular ejection fraction and uh, dilation of the coronary arteries. Many of these patients are actually antibody negative. They are PCR negative, and it is hard to understand their relationship or their exposure to the virus. So by the CDC definition, these would actually not be classified as MISC patients. But I think many of us are seeing these patients come into our hospitals, and it seems as though the timing of their appearance and the very high inflammatory markers with other features such as the low serum sodium, the low platelet count shared by the other more obvious MISC patients makes them likely to be part of this spectrum. We obviously need better biomarkers and better ways of understanding them, but I would submit that I think all three layers of this iceberg represent patients who need to have examination of their heart, they need to have a cardiology consult, they need to have an echocardiogram, because I think they are all having an immune-mediated response to the virus in children with different genetic flavors who are manifesting in different ways clinically. Next slide. We have to remember talk about antibody testing and whether patients are positive or negative for the antibody, we have to be aware of what antibody test is available in our hospitals. In our hospital, we use the Abbott Architect system, which measures IgG antibody to nucleocapsid. But obviously, the virus is a complex structure with lots of options for immune response to uh, different epitopes. And I think as time goes on, 
we will importantly understand the differences, perhaps subtle, in immune responses to the different antigenic structures in the virus that give us different clinical phenotypes. Next slide. So a lot of people are confused about these antibody negative patients who share many of the laboratory features of inflammation with other more typical patients. Next slide. I think we're going to need molecular studies to really sort this out and particularly antibody studies that will help us understand the differences in immune response perhaps across the spectrum of clinical patients. We're hoping to collect some of that data through the 30 sites participating in our CHARM study funded by PCORI and NHLBI, where we are collecting uh, samples and clinical data on these patients across a broad swath of the United States. And we hope that particularly through antibody studies, we can begin to understand details of the immune response. The T cell epitopes will be very important as well. So there will be an answer to what the relationship is between KD and MISC, but there is not an answer right now. Thank you. So Dr. Burns, thank you so much. That was also fantastic. Um, I'd like to transfer uh, control of the slides now over to uh, Dr. Miller uh, to talk about imaging strategy and findings in MISC and specifically the European experience. Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller, you're muted. Okay. Apologies. I was just trying to get control of the slide. So thank you very much, uh, Piers, and to the ASC for the invitation. And um, uh, as I said in my first slide, this is not a cardiology problem. This is a multidisciplinary problem. And the first question is, is what is the diagnosis? And we've heard from the two previous speakers about the uh, differences uh, and also the similarities between some of these inflammatory conditions. We want to ask ourselves, is there hemodynamic stability? How can we measure it? And, and what's, the, what's the cause of it? What's the optimal therapy? And we've already heard there are lots of therapies available. And what sort of structured imaging strategy should we use? And importantly for us, as we uh, face this rapidly escalating new problem, we had to allocate assets and resources to manage the, the condition. So we did a fast track service reconfiguration. We separated out the congenital heart team from the MISC team or the PIMS team as we called it. And the MISC team had cardiologists, echocardiographers and nurse specialists. And we worked very closely with colleagues in uh, infectious diseases, immunology, rheumatology, and general pediatrics. And we stood up uh, three daily MDTs to discuss all of our patients. At one stage, we had up to 30 inpatients with this condition. Um, just to give you a flavor of our age distribution, you can see that this is different to Kawasaki. We have uh, older groups. The mean age is about 11. Uh, more males and females. And in our population in London, we had a very large proportion, 60 to 70 percent, from black, Asian, and minority ethnic uh, groups. So this was out of proportion uh, to the uh, ethnicity distribution in the general population. We had a peak uh, of admissions in uh, late April and early May, and fortunately, it's tailed off as we've come through uh, June. And we've seen about 80 patients in our hospital and then other hospitals in London have seen uh, similar amounts. And so in London, we've, I guess we've seen upwards of uh, 150 or 200 cases. 
The imaging strategy, uh, of course, depends on the presentation as we've heard. And so for those who uh, are critically ill and shocked, we uh, do an ECG and echo on admission, and then we do daily echoes on those PICU patients, and of course, biomarkers and inflammatory markers. Um, for the stable non-PICU patients, we'll do an admission echocardiogram, and then every two to three days, depending on clinical features. To give you a flavor, in our first 72 patients, we did nearly 500 echocardiograms, uh, 25 coronary CTs and 25 cardiac MRIs. The uh, ECHO strategy uh, used both 2D, 3D deformation imaging, and we were looking at both systolic and diastolic function. Our CTs, we used either acutely if there was a rapidly changing coronary situation, or in the first uh, 25 or so, we did surveillance CTs at about two weeks, similarly with MRI. We saw a broad range of arrhythmias from uh, sinus bradycardia being the commonest, we had one patient with a uh, broad complex tachycardia and uh, two patients with STT wave changes. The biomarkers you've already heard about and we measured those uh, in all patients. So we had uh, two teams and our MISC team went to a seven day working early start. So we aimed to have an echo MDT at about 10 a.m. where we would review and read all the echoes uh, before attending the 11 a.m. MDT with uh, infectious diseases and immunology. Uh, our ECHO protocol was similar to our Kawasaki, but we used um, advanced functional ECHO in all patients with uh, uh, 2D quantification, tissue Doppler, speckle tracking, and 3D ECHO uh, in all patients. Uh, we've seen this is a very similar slide to the one Nadine showed. This uh, shows that in many patients, we have pericardial effusion. Uh, very few of them were hemodynamically significant uh, and uh, mitral regurgitation was common initially and that faded uh, towards discharge and in post-discharge uh, post follow-up. We had either prominent coronaries, as you can see here, with uh, tram tracking and uh, very clear coronary uh, uh, outlines, and we had coronary dilatation in the majority of patients, although many didn't uh, uh, reach a Z score of greater than 2 or 2.5. We did, however, see uh, quite a few uh, with abnormal Z scores and with coronary aneurysms. This is one case uh, who developed uh, clear uh, aneurysm of the LAD with a Z score of plus 10, uh, and that has persisted. But about 14% uh, in the Whitaker paper that we contributed to, which was the London experience, uh, uh, Liz reported 14% had dilated uh, coronaries. LV dysfunction was common at presentation and got worse in the first couple of days before usually responding. Uh, in the Pan London paper, 50% presented with shock, 62% with LV dysfunction, uh, two thirds had a troponin rise and 100% had an abnormal NT pro BMP. Most of the patients did respond and recover. However, we had several patients who have persistent LV dysfunction, and we had a couple of worrying patients who were discharged with normal LV function who represented in clinic with abnormal LV function. We've now followed up about 70 of these patients in clinic, uh, initially at two weeks and then uh, later at six weeks. And fortunately, the great majority have normal function, at least grossly. However, it's important uh, to determine what we're using. So here, just using uh, 2D and M mode, we can see gross changes. And this was uh, one of our worst cases, obviously. But what we found was that um, uh, uh, there were um, uh, more, more subtle defects, which were seen on other uh, imaging modalities. This was a patient who presented with LV uh, thrombi, it was a burnt out uh, PIMS case. And we saw that in cases where there was coronary dilatation, it appeared more common than in KD with a different pattern of distribution. We found that 3D ejection fraction and deformation imaging was much more sensitive than M mode or 2D ejection fractions uh, in our group of 80 or so patients. 
So systolic function was commonly impaired, but the simple functional uh, assessments using shortening fraction or ejection fraction uh, did vary and need to be interpreted with caution. We found the advanced functional imaging much more informative. We also found anecdotally that intensive immunomodulation was beneficial. So we would go early and go hard with steroids uh, and um, other immunomodulation. We used in the second, co second half of the cohort, we used a lot of tocilizumab and that appeared to have a good effect. But this is a, a clearly an uncontrolled anecdotal report. The coronary vasculitis did appear to resolve, at least grossly, but who knows what's happening at an ultrastructural level. Cardiac CT was used and we can see a normal cardiac CT on the left with a normal left system. And then in the middle frame, we can see a dilated left anterior descending with aneurysm and the same case in a coronal section. Cardiac uh, MRI was useful, but looking specifically at subtle changes. And so we saw cardiac CT to be useful where there was um, uh, 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 I, um, indications of uh, infarction or uh, late GAD enhancement. If we can go back one slide, please. The, um, thank you. The um, APC, which is the Association of European Pediatric and General Cardiology, uh, have done a survey. We led a uh, rapid response, real-time survey, and uh, we got responses from 55 centers in 17 uh, countries across Europe. You can see on the bottom histogram that the uh, peak incidence was also uh, between April and May. The age pyramid was very similar to ours in London with many older patients. Uh, we had uh, more than 280 cases reported and LV dysfunction was reported in greater than 90% of cases, shock in 40% and arrhythmia in 35%. Only a minority had uh, cardiac CT or cardiac MRI, and so those data are of uh, 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 limited value. In summary, I'll just finish by saying uh, my advice is if you're facing this uh, wave of PIMS, TS or MISC patients, uh, you might consider separate, uh, setting up a separate team to manage them. Uh, look at your imaging protocol. Make sure you've got clear questions that you're asking your sonographer. Agree, for example, which Z scores you're using and all use the same ones. Uh, we've used the multimodality approach. We've found that very useful. MRI strain has been very sensitive. And we've had to set up, as Nadine has set up in New York, we've had to set up a specific uh, PIMS follow-up clinic for these patients but we've used our previous experience in Kawasaki disease to guide uh, follow-up intervals. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, that was that, that was that was great, and I think that's a, 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 a perfect segue into our final uh, presenter, Dr. Friedman, um, who will speak about treatment and prognosis and, and uh, kind of next steps for multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Dr. Friedman. Thank you for having me. Uh, Liz, if you could pass control of the slides, would be great. Uh, I have no disclosures. Uh, first, to start with an overview of MASC treatment. This has been referred to a lot already in prior talks, so I'll go through it relatively fast. But I think that the primary modality of treatment is actually supportive care. It's over 50%, in some cases, as high as 80% of patients present in shock. Careful fluid resuscitation and inotropic management is of utmost importance. A smaller percent of patients will require mechanical ventilation and rarely ECMO is needed for circulatory support. The second mainstay of treatment has been immunomodulating medications, including IVIG, steroids, and to a lesser extent biologics, which I'll show in subsequent slides. A big question mark still in management is what to do about antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapy, which we'll cover. And then um, the last segment of management is, is a direct antiviral medications, which has uh, basically been shown not to be effective and are really not part of the therapy of MISC because these patients mostly are PCR negative and IgG positive, indicating they have a history of disease but not acute active viral infection. When we look at what's been done so far, this is the best data we have because there are no randomized trials or even comparative effectiveness trials yet. This is a, a, a slide showing the, the um, major trials, a major series of more than 10 patients in MISC that have been 
published to date. And what you can see is that IVIG has been the most commonly used medication, um, used in about 75% of reported cases. But within K-series, there's a wide practice variation with uh, about 50% to 100% of patients receiving IVIG as first-line therapy. Corticosteroids have been most commonly used as uh, adjunctive or second-line therapy. Um, but again, wide practice variation with about 50% of all patients globally receiving corticosteroids. And then about 10 to 30%, depending on the trial, receiving additional biologics. This would be things like interleukin-1 inhibitors, interleukin-6 inhibitors, or uh, TNF-alpha blockers. Looking at the specific medications, um, most centers have used intravenous immunoglobulin as first-line therapy, given its effectiveness in KD and other vasculitis um, and myocarditis. People have used a dose of one, or one gram to two grams uh, per kilogram, mostly, although these patients, as several people have mentioned, are generally larger and bigger than our KD population. So we don't know exact dosing, especially for those patients who are 70, 80, 90 kilograms or bigger. Corticosteroids have been the second line therapy um, and used mainly in two scenarios. The first is in patients presenting with shock, um, where uh, providers have felt that IVIG is not, alone is not sufficient anti-inflammatory therapy. And the second scenario is when uh, patients have received IVIG and have re recurrent or refractory symptoms. Dosing is varied. Most places have used one milligram per kilogram twice a day uh, dosing. Others have even used reported pulse dose steroids. Um, biologics like anakinra uh, and interleukin-6 uh, inhibitors, as well as uh, infliximab, which is a TNF-alpha blocker, have also been used generally as adjunctive therapy in patients who either have cytokine storm, who are highly inflamed, or who do not respond to initial IVIG in steroids. As mentioned on the first slide, direct antiviral therapy like remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and convalescent plasma really doesn't play a role in MIS-C therapy. In terms of thromboprophylaxis with anticoagulation or antiplatelet agent, again, wide practice variation in the public stu published studies so far. Um, some studies have uh, given no patients aspirin and some have given 100%. Um, but the majority of, given, majority of studies have given most patients aspirin uh, at an antiplatelet dosing. Heparin, um, uh, low molecular weight heparin has been even more variable, whether it's given um, pro prophylactic dosing, therapeutic dosing, or not at all has experienced, shown wide practice variation. Anticoagulation is a big question mark. Um, we know these patients are at increased uh, risk for thrombosis because they're in a hypocoagulable state based on their labs showing very high D-dimers and fibrinogens in many patients as well as thromboelastogram findings showing activated platelets, high clot strength. And lastly, due to the adult experience showing um, extensive throm uh, thrombus burden uh, in patients with COVID-19. That said, in MISC, to my knowledge, there's no reported cases of thrombosis, although uh, Dr. Miller just showed one, um, but generally has not been reported frequently, but certainly a concern in these patients. I think there are a few cases where we can achieve consensus on anticoagulation, which is uh, patients who present with KD or KD-like features should be treated similarly to KD patients with low-dose aspirin for four to six weeks. Those with aneurysms should receive um, aspirin if they're small or medium aneurysms and large giant aneurysms, aspirin and therapeutic anticoagulation. And those with dysfunction or known thrombosis should be aggressively anticoagulated with therapeutic anticoagulation and aspirin. Unfortunately, that leaves the majority of patients who don't fit any of those categories. And I think it's still a big question mark of when to use prophylactics versus anticoagulation, uh, a therapeutic anticoagulation, and when to use aspirin for antiplatelet effect. Some have proposed using a D-dimer cutoff of three or five, but there's really no data yet to support that. Turning to prognosis, in order to understand the prognosis, I think we need to think about the mechanisms of cardiac injury in MISC. On the left-hand side, we uh, have the proposed mechanism. I think most people are coalescing around the idea that this is primarily uh, a, a, um, a syndrome in genetically susceptible hosts where there's dysregulated inflammation and immune response, possibly with smaller contributors of microvascular dysfunction, coagulopathy, oxygen supply, demand mismatch, and less likely direct viral toxicity, which presents, as people have shown, with shock, uh, impaired function, and in some cases, Kawasaki-like illness. And then the three long-term problems we, we're most aware of are the conduction abnormalities, including heart block, coronary involvement, and myocardial involvement. Uh, as Dr. Miller and Nadine both mentioned, um, in order to determine long-term cardiac prognosis, it's gonna be really important to have a standardized approach to how we follow these patients. Uh, and I think we can all agree, echo and EKG at diagnosis, and then as needed during the acute hospital stay, then at one to two weeks at a minimum, four to six weeks, 
uh, over follow-up. And then for patients who have cardiac involvement, long-term follow-up will be needed to monitor the three, three cardiac issues listed here. Uh, as Dr. Miller showed, cardiac MRI is being used in the acute and subacute phase to better characterize myocardial tissue characteristics. In terms of the trajectory of LV function, this was the first study to really show the trajectory of LV function. It's a multicenter ICU study um, from Switzerland and France, and they in included a really high acuity cohort. Patients only who had, uh, only included patients who had acute LV dysfunction defined as EF less than 50 or cardiogenic shock, and it followed 35 children this, this spring. Again, very high acuity. A third of them had EF less than 30%, 80% were on inotropes, and 28% on ECMO. They all received IVIG and a third received steroids. Um, when we look, this study uh, has several characteristic findings. The median age was 10, similar to other studies. Uh, gastrointestinal symptoms are really common. 80% presented in shock, again, a very high acuity cohort. And about 20% had coronary changes. The most important thing I took away from this study though is, is down here, which is that 71% um, of patients recovered within a week. So the, even though these were very sick kids, the vast majority of them recovered their LV function and did it quickly. In fact, the median time to recovery of LV function was two days. So most of these kids improved and they improved fast. Again, this is a, additional data from this um, study, again, showing very high acuity cohort with lots of inotropic needs, respiratory support, and even frequent VA ECMO. But again, no deaths and 71% recovered within a week uh, to normalized function. Two additional studies on LV function, both from New York that were mentioned earlier, and they both show similar things, which is that um, on presentation, acute LV dysfunction is fairly common, 61% in this study, all mild and to moderate in this study. Uh, and that the vast majority either were always normal or improved to normal um, at discharge with a small percent who remained mildly depressed at discharge. The second study um, is another study from New York and showed that 65% uh, of patients had LV dysfunction at presentation with a median EF of 46.6. Uh, uh, in this study, the most were mild to moderate, although there were a few with quite severe dysfunction. And they reported that 95% recovered by discharge to normal LV function, despite, again, having a pretty high acuity cohort with the ECMO use, balloon pump, and, and lots of inotropes. Turning lastly to the coronary artery prognosis, that's a little bit less certain. We need long-term follow-up, but I think it depends a lot on the pathology of the aneurysms, which is still unknown. There are two options for the pathology of the aneurysms. The first is that this is Kawasaki disease-like uh, pathology, which is what Ben well described. It involves inflammatory cell infiltrates early with neutrophils, followed by then myofibroblasts, lymphocytes, and other cells, inflaming the vessel wall and leading to a degradation of the uh, vessel wall layers, and then later followed by luminal myofibroblastic proliferation. And we know the prognosis for these type of aneurysms fairly well. What's less certain though is could this be related just to uh, high fever and circulating inflammatory mediators? This study from 2013 looked at patients who were highly inflamed and admitted with febrile illness that was not Kawasaki disease and it showed that in highly inflamed patients without Kawasaki disease the coronary disease scores are actually above normal and that a handful, a small percent, but about 10 percent had coronary artery Z scores above two. So it's possible that some of these MISC patients fit more in option B type of pathology, which is more likely to be transient um, and more benign than the KD-like pathology. We know from KD that the biggest risk factor, biggest uh, predictor of long-term prognosis is uh, coronary Z score in the acute and subacute phase. This data um, from our group shows that the size of aneurysm at diagnosis is highly related to the probability of regression with large aneurysms rarely regressing and small aneurysms almost always regressing. There's lots of data from Japan showing that over um, many decades, um, coronary artery events like stenosis are highly related to the size of the aneurysm in the acute phase, both by Japanese Ministry of Health criteria here and by Z-score criteria. So I think for coronary artery aneurysm prognosis, we're really left following the AHA classification uh, and risk schema from the 2017 guidelines shown here which is um, uh, classifies by both the acute involvement early in the disease course, um, which is the, the, the primary number, and then the, the number after the decimal point is the current status. So classification one is uh, no involvement, two is dilation with z-score two to two and a half, three is a small aneurysm, two and a half to five, uh, four is a medium aneurysm, five to 10 z-score, and then greater than 10 um, or absolute dimension above eight is a, is a larger giant aneurysm, class five. And then that scheme is used to determine both um, acute therapy um, and chronic therapy with anticoagulation, beta blockers, and statin, and frequency of follow-up and need for assessment of inducible myocardial ischemia, 
and frequency of more advanced cardiac imaging for the coronaries. Um, so until we learn more, I think that's the best approach is to use the KD experience. And then as we learn more, we can tailor our approach to uh, this disease specifically. I'm gonna stop there and see what questions we can answer. That was fantastic, uh, Dr. Friedman. Thank you so much. Um, we have about um, um, four minutes for for uh, uh, for questions, um, and and several have come in through the uh, for, through the Q and A app, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, pose these to our our uh, panelists. Um, one is 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 uh, the question of rhythm disturbances was was uh, uh, briefly mentioned. Um, can our panelists exp expand on, on how common a, 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 a presenting sign that is or how likely that's to develop and long-term complications such as heart block? So in our... Uh, Piers, I'll start with that. Um, the APC pan-European study found that 35% of children had some form of arrhythmia. Uh, very few of the arrhythmias were serious. What we've seen in our own population is Sinus bradycardia is common. Uh, a little bit of PR interval lengthening is common. Um, and then more serious arrhythmias are less common is our experience. Great, thank you. Dr. Friedman, were you going to also add something? Yeah, similarly, we've seen um, about 20 to 25% have um, some degree of heart block, usually first degree. We've had two who've had um, high grade heart block, one third degree, and it, they got better with anti-inflammatory therapy. Um, but it, it, you can have that progression to, to high-grade heart block. Okay. Um, a separate question coming in from the group um, asking um, um, or, present, or, or uh, telling a, a case of a newborn presenting with sepsis, evolving to pulmonary hypertension, um, um, and then 10th day out having severe pulmonary hypertension, diffuse coronary artery dilation, mother COVID-19 positive, newborn negative. Has, um, has there been experience among the panelists with newborns uh, uh, presenting? Not in our group. We okay. haven't anything similar either. Well, clearly, uh, uh, um, clearly more to know. L let me uh, um, let me ask a, a, a question of my own, and I, and I think this uh, um, probably highlights the need for our for the long term follow up uh, uh, for this disease. But really fascinating to to hear that patients may recover and then uh, function and then get worse again, and, and this kind of raises some questions that have come up through the pediatric cardiomyopathy registry where patients may recover dilated cardiomyopathy and then present uh, with death or needing transplantation. Um, um, thoughts on, any, any thoughts, speculation on why that might happen or, um, um, or, or, or is this something we're just going to have to continue to watch and, and, and learn more about this whole disease? Well, Piers, um, uh, we've seen a handful of cases who have developed late LV dysfunction, and it wasn't clear looking back on whether they're inflammatory markers or biomarkers or their course during uh, hospitalization was any different from the others. So I think it's early. It's too early to say. We have been surprised. We've had some with LV dysfunction, and we've had uh, also, a case who came back with uh, development of aneurysms. It's more a sort of a KD-like picture where they, they came a, a couple of weeks afterwards. But the LV dysfunction group were, were surprising to us, and so we're, we're just trying to understand that still. This is Nadine. Um, the cases we have seen so far, we've seen half of our patients, so maybe 18 up until that one month visit. We haven't seen anyone with um, who yet to have developed LV dilation or um, LV dysfunction. But again, it's very early, too early to tell. Uh, that's why we're planning to continue following them up. Well, 
clearly we are not out of the pandemic by any means yet um, and clearly a lot for us to continue to work on to know to understand uh, both for our patients and to better care for our patients. Um, that brings us up to two o'clock, uh, 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 so time for us to, uh, to stop. I would like to thank all of our panelists for their uh, uh, exceptional uh, uh, presentations and for being willing to share their knowledge uh, with us this afternoon, this morning, this evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Um, um, and, um, and I'd like to thank all the uh, uh, people who have logged in to, to uh, listen in and participate in, the, in, this, in this webinar. We really hope that um, it has been useful information for you all. Um, we will uh, uh, um, collate all of the questions that have come in, any ones that we have not been able to answer uh, this afternoon, um, and we'll send uh, uh, replies out to, uh, uh, to the audience. Um, and then lastly, uh, please uh, uh, note how to claim CME. Um, um, you should receive an email with these instructions as well. Um, so again, thank you um, very much to our uh, panelists. Thank you to you all for attending. And thank you to the American Society of Echo, uh, Echocardiography uh, for sponsoring this webinar on behalf of the Council on Pediatric and Congenital Heart Disease. Thank you very much. I hope you all stay well and stay healthy.